you know, when you're when you you start out playing music, it takes you a while to kind of find your groove and what you know what you want to do and what you want to say. It was about I don't know, trying to make something lasting and make something that you could feel proud of. It was never intended to be this big thing. We never got together being like we're gonna, you know, rule the world. It was just a band that was a lot of fun. From there, you know, we wrote a couple songs, recorded a couple demos, never really thought it'd become anything. I mean, we were high school students that, um, you know, had aspirations to go on to, to college and to do whatever kind of normal people do. And now we're, we're recording in a studio with a producer that is expecting more of you than a hobby. And uh, I think it was a real eye-opener. I mean, at the time it seemed crazy that someone from your town could be a professional musician. And so, you know, in my formative years musically to see someone so close to me get out of town, like be able to take their thing that I was doing every Friday at the YMCA and to see that across the world was a wild thing. That time we like had no idea, we were still so like in the moment that we would never think that it would have been like you know, our career for 15 years and uh, that we would especially be doing a 10 year anniversary for that record even before it was recorded, we would have had no idea. So it was all just like a very surreal experience. And that was when we started thinking, wow, like this is, this is crazy. Like we're, you know, people are really latching onto our band and really care about what we have to say and what we're doing. And I think that that was really the moment we, we understood that, that that this band wasn't just a little side project anymore.
founding of Silverstein. Where do I begin? Uh, we started off um, in the suburbs uh, that way. The Silverstein story, from my perspective, starts with Aldershot High School Jazz Band. You know, we were a bunch of kids growing up in the local music scene that wanted to play a band that sounded something like this. You know, we all had the same influences, um, went to shows together, kind of met each other through mutual friends, and just came together kind of over the mutual kind of appreciation for this style of music. I joined the jazz band in the ninth grade, and I hoped I would get better at guitar by playing jazz. But in the jazz band, this is where it really starts to come around to Silverstein, I met a guy named Richard McWalter. He liked a lot of cool music, and we would listen to cool music in his car on the way to the jazz band practices. And that's where I was introduced to a lot of underground music that I didn't already know. Because I had listened to a lot of punk, but he got me more into hardcore. And I was like, yo, guy, this is, this is like cool music. I want to play music like this. We were all already doing stuff. You know, we were already playing in local bands uh, in the scene, you know, the Toronto suburbs and in downtown Toronto, we were all playing shows. Uh, you know, I was in a punk rock band and we were pretty successful, which was cool, but uh, I always felt like there was something more for me. And we ended up starting a jam we wrote a couple of songs and we we're like yeah this is this is fun and I like the sounds that we're making here maybe we find some other members and uh, I think some of the first people we talked to were Paul Kohler and Shane Told and we were in Josh's basement we were we were playing music uh, that we loved and we never thought oh we're gonna make this record we're gonna go on this tour it was never like that it was just a bunch of guys hanging out uh, in a basement playing music we loved. And that's, that's really where it all came from. So we realized that um, there was something here, something special, and it's something that we weren't ready to just like pack up and you know, make it a, just a past hobby. Well, my first uh, introduction to Silverstein was as a fan. And at the time, I didn't really play bass. I, I owned a bass, and I had the intention of like wanting to play bass. Uh, but I knew Shane and Josh and a little bit Paul um, through their former bands. Then I saw, or I heard about Silverstein, and I went to see them play. It was like probably only their fifth or sixth show. And uh, they didn't really have a bass player at the time. Guys would show up and play for like one show, learn the songs, play for a show, and then, uh, then bail again. So we had a bit of trouble, but then uh, we knew Bill because he was a big fan of music, going to shows. Um, and we thought that his passion would make up for his lack of skill. Because uh, at that point, he, I don't think, played bass at all, really. He had maybe touched one a couple times, but didn't have a, a whole lot of uh, experience. So I kind of just, I think, accidentally uh, fell into the position by like not really giving them enough time to find another person to do it. So I just like went to the first practice and like learned the songs as I went and played the first show and that was in December of 2000. So it's almost 15 years later now and uh, here I am. <laughs> I mean, being from Burlington, Ontario and growing up in sort of the, the music scene there, you know, spending almost every Friday night I had in my youth at the YMCA. Uh, Silverstein were, you know, the heroes of that scene. Silverstein was like the beacon that said like, you can play music professionally being from a small town. I first heard When Broken Is Easily Fixed when I was, um, I mean, I bought it at the store and my dad drove me to the, you know, to the store and from the store because I was young and couldn't drive a car and I put it into the car CD player, and he was, he, he seemed disappointed in me. <laughs> you know, that wasn't music to him. It was probably, for sure, actually, the first time he had heard a band with screaming in it. And Silverstein was one of the first bands I heard with screaming, uh, if not the first. And so, I mean, I loved that record. That record changed the way I thought about music entirely. I didn't know that you could do that. Yeah.
to so long, girl. And by the way you look, I find the same. You were not impressed. I heard you let that little friend of mine take off your party dress. The first record when Broken is Easily Fixed was completely different from the other records because when Broken is Easily Fixed was really like a compilation of everything we'd done together as a band forever. So our first record really wasn't even an album, it was just a compilation of our entire beginnings. And Discovering the Waterfront was the first time we were all together uh, as a band, we'd already been on tour, we'd, already, we'd, we'd known we were, you know, this was what we were doing with our lives, and we were in a room and we were able to like, alright, we're going to write a record. During the time of making Discovering the Waterfront back in 2005, um, I don't think really any of us understood the importance of a sophomore album. Up until that point, we had been grinding it out with, um, 
van tours and, you know, sleeping on floors and, and you know, g getting there, you know. Well, for the first time, we sat down and wrote the entire record all at once. Uh, and I think it, it makes the songs feel a little more cohesive, a little more comfortable next to each other. And the recording process, we actually, for the first time, went away from home to go out and record. The, the first record and the uh, previous EPs that we had released had all been done in studios around Toronto. Um, a lot of them, small studios, like basement, home studio type of things. So we wrote a record, we flew all the way to California, we recorded in some very, like, very prestigious studios with a great producer, and that was the first time for that. So the first and second records could not have been more different. It's strong stuff. We, we had spent a lot of time writing and recording those songs, a lot of time like demoing them and then re-demoing them, and that's something that we had never done before. Like the demo was the stuff you released. That's how we always did it. But we spent so much time um, preparing the album for Discovering the Waterfront that I think we were in a pretty good headspace. We were very nervous. And at the time, I was doing interviews like this and I was people were asking me, oh, you know, the sophomore slump. Are you guys worried about the sophomore slump? I was like, oh, no, 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 we just do our thing. But secretly, inside, hell yeah, I was nervous. I think the expectations were pretty high. And I know for myself, I, I had never really taken it quite that seriously. I had always been more more into the, the fun side of it. I, I liked playing guitar because I thought it was fun. It felt, it felt real for the first time, you know? It, was, it wasn't just a couple of kids hanging out in a basement making noise. It was a, a job, a career. I specifically remember there was a weekend where Cameron said, uh, okay, Bill and Paul, I'm gonna like lock you in the studio for an entire day and I want you to play through all the songs just on the drum and bass to click track and record it. And then I'm gonna come in every couple hours and like listen to the recordings and tell you when it's okay for you to leave. The amount of preparation on Discovering the Waterfront was unlike anything we had done before. And I think that is why the album was successful. And as, as we try to tell new upcoming aspiring musicians, it's like, Focus on your songs, you know, and your songwriting. It's like, it's not just putting together a couple cool parts and going into the studio. It, for us, it was like writing these songs, going to demo them. And then when we got to California, our producer being like, okay, now we're gonna isolate just the bass and the drums and see how they're interacting together and make sure that they're doing the right stuff. And to that, at that point, I, I never, we've never done anything like that. I never heard of anyone doing something like that. So Bill and I spent like almost the weekend just rehearsing. And this was crazy because you strip away a lot of the melody and all the vocals and you have to really think about it. But I think that experience even personally made me a better drummer and made me become more prepared for the studio. I remember we were on this summer tour. We were playing to some bit, pretty big crowds and the record was already finished, so we played a couple couple of new songs. So we would we would play Smile in Your Sleep. And it went over so well. Like the song just had this build to it where we would we would start and people were like, okay, that's a cool riff, and then oh big chorus, but by the end, it was like we'd encompass like everybody that was there was just drawn in. And this was a song, you have to remember, this is a song no one had ever heard before and the entire park of Warp Tour is moshing. So that was like a pretty crazy feel feeling at that moment to know that, hey, maybe this record is gonna be something special. Maybe this song is gonna be something special. When it came out, I think it sold like 25,000 copies first week, and we didn't even think that like when Broken would sell 2,500, that was huge. And we were, yeah, we were on like the Billboard chart for the first time, and it was like crazy to think that there was like a somewhat of a national and international like focus on our band. But I don't think we knew the extent of, of, of it all, you know. It, we didn't realize it would sell as many copies as it did and, and hold such a special place in so many people's hearts in their, uh, in their childhoods or their adolescence. It, it kind of just took off from there. It wasn't like overnight success, but it was like more tour offers, bigger opportunities, more relationships with, with bigger companies and people, and it just, 
um, that really kind of started our professional career, I would say. The producer called me kind of congratula congratulating me, and I was like, oh, you know, congratulate, congratulations to you too, you know, you were a big part of this. And he said it to me, would you change, like, what would you change? I was like, I wouldn't change anything. Like, I totally, like, everything we did, I understand why we did it, I understand it. And I had this similar uh, question when we were doing the 10 year anniversary tour, like, would you change anything on the record? And like, I wouldn't change a fucking note. We are one guy. We're gonna play a concert show. Part of the Tokito's lifestyle. It'll be a bit of a Whoa. weird show. Uh, it's a different style than you know, we're used to, a little corner stage. I don't know if we'll be able to fit our whole back on. I don't know what the crew has decided to set it up like, but let's go check it out. It's not ideal, but it'll work. Hi. My name is Billy, and I like beer. The cranberry. Ooh, nice. Right now, I'm about to drink my 2500 unique beer with the Founders KBS. We are at the Alamo in San Antonio, Texas, right over here. Uh, it's not as big as I thought it would be. Um, we're also not supposed to uh, defecate around the perimeter. I think as a rock band, you can go to jail for that. Wait, what's gonna happen? I saw the biggest dog I've ever seen today. It was a Great Dane about this big. It caused like Honda Civic. It's a nice light. I feel okay, we haven't even started the show yet and I'm already sweating though. It's gonna be a hot one, I think. Dallas, Texas, they'll get you. Got a little bit of sweat on you. Now you got a little bit of sweat on you. Is that a cold sweat though, because you were too chilly? Yeah. I'm getting so pumped. I'm just getting pumped. Right. Up, 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 up. up. Well, you can just use like a little snippet so it looks like I don't know, right? Plugging in my in ears, gonna put them on, going inside, gonna play a song. Chains woman up, back there. Josh is wearing his nice hair. Groggy and foggy and weird. Not even one. Love you. Love you. <gasps> I'm nervous. We're doing this Yahoo live stream where the whole dang internet can watch our dang show should they choose. <laughs> Fathom the amount of infinite time that you inspired. You inspired an infinite amount of time. It's about like how the horses man. They jumped on the show. I don't know where they came from, but they're just jumping around like horses. Ah, uh, walking. Gonna make love in love park. It's a place where love is made. So there's a black hole that uh, just discovered that it's reportedly uh, 90 billion times the size of the sun. What right, color right. is this? Black and blue. I don't so see black and it blue looks, to me. It looks gold, white, white. white and gold. gold there's white. no gold way. White. No, that black. is white yeah. gold and that's white right, and gold. That's white. Black! Gold! Black! That gold! Black. That is like fucking gold! Yo, this triangle? We started talking about doing a 10 year anniversary tour for Discovering the Waterfront around the time we were recording This Is How the Wind Shifts. So it, was a long time in the making and it was on it's been on the horizon it's been in the you know on some burner on our stove for a very long time basically since the idea was first brought up i was dreading learning the record on guitar it, it was definitely interesting relearning the songs uh, on discovering the waterfront i wouldn't say it was difficult it was challenging in that we had to learn how to play things that didn't make sense things that when you don't know as many rules to music, you can get away with doing some funky things as far as song structure and technique, but yeah, once you've moved past that, it's hard to kind of get yourself back into the, the mind space of somebody that is playing more from the heart than from the head. We discovered some things uh, in, the, in the Silverstein Guitar Players Club, Josh, Bill, and I, that everyone was doing wrong. It just, it took like, you gotta revisit all that stuff. You know, it's hard, it's been 10 years. Who could remember? 
I don't remember what I ate for lunch yesterday. Or today. <laughs> Once we were in, the, in a practice space and you know, everyone had done the same thing and we came in and was like, okay, all right, Paul, two, three, four. And we just would play the song. And it, like, I looked over and I saw, like, I saw Josh and Billy like, smiling. You know? It was like the energy of playing them again live was, was pretty cool. And it was funny because a couple times the first, the first practice, I actually didn't remember the words. So I'm there like, pull up my phone, I'm Googling like azlyrics.com or songmeetings.net. I'm like Googling the lyrics, which actually, you know, proved to be kind of cool because it, it, you know, it gave me some insight onto like what I was saying, where I was as a person, you know, 10 years ago and where I am now. And it, it was actually kind of, it was interesting to look back. The tour for Discovering the Waterfront, I think was similar to the launch of the album. It's like, we knew people were excited, we knew there was a buzz, and then finally when it happened, it was like crazy. Like, um, I remember just playing the first show in London, and you know, that was gonna be kind of our warm up show for us to get into this. You know, it was a local area show, so we did a day of pre production and then we rolled in to do the show, and it was like the crowd response was 10 times better than you could probably even imagine. I think we anticipated that the reaction would be good and we knew that the people who cared about the record were very passionate about it and that is just sort of the case through and through with Silverstein fans is that they've got like a remarkable passion and it's a really incredible thing to watch. I think the thing we didn't quite anticipate was how many people would feel that way. When the backdrop fell for the first time revealing the Discovering the Waterfront artwork and the uh, crowd went wild, if you will. Uh, it just made me feel really nostalgic. It was one of those moments where you turn around and look at what you've accomplished. You know, it uh, it felt validating and it felt it just it just felt like everything was clicking into place. It's like okay, I'm not coming home for seven weeks, and this is going to be the biggest tour of our career. Which is like to say that 15 years later that you've done you know, that you were doing or just have just completed the the biggest tour of your career. Um, as a headliner and as something that you've been fully a part of, um, it's unbelievable.